Blended Podcasts. Brought to you by Blended Audio. Exploring the unexplained. Breaking down barriers. Putting the macabre under the microscope. Dissecting the disturbing. Seeking out the sinister. Bringing you the jinkies and the jump scares. Hey guys, and welcome to the first episode of Freaky Fridays with your hosts, Devin. And Megan. And today's episode is just going to be a bit about the two of us, how we met, um, our involvement with the paranormal, and we're going to be sharing a few of our ghost stories with you. Uh, yeah, so Dev and I actually met in film school yeah. uh, during both years. Uh, I think we only really got to know each other in our second year. Yeah, we, we, we met in first year, but we only sort of became friends in our second year. Yeah, definitely. And then upon graduating, I think it was a year out, and you contacted me and we thought, uh, and we spoke about doing a uh, paranormal documentary together, um, where we had a lot of really cool experiences and I think that was one of the things that just how we bonded because we both had this interest <laughs> in speaking of bonding I feel like we have to say that our, one of our first bonding points was Scooby-Doo and uh-huh. that, I think that's it, the paranormal thing all for us exactly that says everything <laughs> to this day we still have little Scooby-Doo marathons together oh we do but as far as our early days go um, I know that I grew up in a very open household when it came to speaking about the paranormal um, it was never one of those things where my mom would be like, mm, you know, overactive imagination. She was pretty much like, yeah, tell me your stories. Tell me if you saw a ghost sort of thing. I don't know about you. Yeah, my parents both were actually like very open-minded. Um, I know my dad especially, so would encourage a very wild imagination um, when he was a kid. But yeah, if I ran up to them and said, oh, I saw this or Ooh, so just anything very unnatural or unusual, they wouldn't like try and send me to a mental asylum. <laughs> they were like, very open-minded, very accepting. And my mom always would tell me she believed that there is more out in the world than what we can see and what we know. Well, I also grew up loving horror and loving ghost stories. So my mom was always telling me ghost stories and she actually had a few of her own like that happened to her when she was a youngster. I think she was about 16. And um, she and my grandparents moved into a house that my uncle had actually bought to flip. It was an old rundown house. He renovated it completely. <clears throat> and if you're, you know, involved in the paranormal, you know that renovating an already haunted place is the worst idea. Yeah, it spikes up a lot of activity. Yeah, so he, you know, worked on this place, did it up, and my grandparents, I believe, were having their own house built at the time, and their lease at the place that they were in was up, so they asked if they could move into this house just until they could move into the new house. Um, And weirdly enough, one of the first things my uncle said was, okay, yeah, I hope you're going to be happy here and you don't encounter any ghosts. (laughs) That's a very big warning sign that would put me off. That's like the beginning of your stereotypical haunted house horror movie. Exactly, don't go down that road. But they moved in anyway and um, I mean it wasn't long before it was their first night in and they had their first paranormal experience you see off the bat there's just nothing good coming of this (laughs) and it was actually my mom who had the first paranormal experience Um, they were obviously still unpacking and they left a whole bunch of moving boxes in their passageway that led from the bedrooms to the kitchen and my mom said she woke up in the middle of the night and she could hear my grandpa stomping down the passage really loudly knocking over boxes opening the fridge just being really loud and inconsiderate and um the next morning at breakfast she was like hey old man like what's that about you know people are sleeping and he was like i did not get up last night oh no 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 (laughs) no one got up but my mom distinctly heard someone stomping down the passage oh that's scary yeah (laughs) i don't know how i would have handled that i would have been like okay since we haven't unpacked the boxes yet why don't we just load them back into the car and leave (laughs) for me and i think this goes for both of us we try and keep a like not key but we are skeptical about things so oh, for yeah. me my coping mechanism for that would be to just logically try and like put something to that except i guess if nobody in the house was actually doing that there's no logical i feel like the only logical and in inverted commas excuse for that would be like oh maybe someone was sleepwalking and they don't remember you know yeah. but there were there were so many other things that happened that just sort of drove that home as being a paranormal oh, experience that would scare the living daylights out of me there was like i said there were so many other things that happened 
happened to my mom. Um, it was specifically my mom, and I have this feeling that it had to do with her being a teenager. And you know, your emotions are very like tumultuous when you're a teenager, and I think that amps up activity. Well, actually, funny enough, and this will come into one of my stories later, um, what I only found out recently is that poltergeists and ghosts latch on to teenage girls when they start menstruation because yeah. they are emotionally vulnerable and all of that. So that could very well be. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I don't believe... My aunt was about four years older than my mom. I don't know if she was still in the house at that time, um, but my mom experienced the majority of the activity and she herself describes it as poltergeist activity because it was very mischievous and, you know, just chaotic. Um, one of the, my favorite stories, there are a couple from this house, um, I'm just picking a handful and this is my favorite one, is that my mom's bedroom was next to like a little alleyway between her, their house and the next door neighbor's house and they had ash stone down on the ground in the alleyway and a little gate. And my mom came home from a friend's house the one night and she could hear someone crunching on the ash stone. Oh, that's scary. And she was like, oh damn, she didn't go to the paranormal. She was like, oh damn, there is a stranger trying to break into our home. Ran to get my gran and was like, there's someone trying to break into our house. Like, come on. So my gran went to the bedroom, couldn't hear a thing. And she was like, nice one. Thanks for waking me up. Good night. And as my gran was going down the um, down the hallway back to her room, my mom heard it again, called her, and my gran opened the window and stuck her head out and could hear someone. That's a very bold move. I would not yeah. do that. Who knows what's outside there? <laughs> but then on the other hand, like I said, there was a little gate there that had a sliding lock. And every night before bed, my grandpa would make sure the sliding lock was in place and go to bed. And my mom would hear this gate sliding open and creaking oh, back and forward. My God. And my grandpa would go out the next day and the lock would be undone. And this happened so often that he eventually bricked it up. Or no, what happened was my grandpa made sure that the lock could not be unlocked. And my mom noticed a couple years later when new people had moved in that they bricked up the alleyway. So we're presuming they have the same experience. Good grief. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty spooky. Yeah, it really is. But I want to hear some of your stories. Like, what are what are some of your favorites that you've heard? So I know my mom, also growing up, she used to tell me about also the old house that they were growing up in. Um, and it was my mom, her mom, and my gran, and my grandfather, and then she had two brothers as well. And funny enough, every single one of them would say the same thing. Um, it's not too much to the story, but there was a passageway in the house. Always with the passageways, man. <laughs> <laughs> and it was fine during the day. It was at night, the moment it got to night, and the passageway was dark, and you had to walk all the way to the other end of the passage to turn the light on. Oh, no, thank you. Um, and apparently that walk used to freak everybody out. <laughs> they said it was fine if you got halfway, but it was mm. the moment you got that second halfway, it just did not feel right. Um, hmm. It just... Yeah, the hair on the back of their necks would stand up and each one of them came out saying this. That's crazy. I think it was my dad though who definitely had a lot more experiences <laughs> in his life. It was kind of interesting hearing this stuff. Hmm. Um, but uh, we've got, uh, got a whole long line family of doctors, my grandfather, my hmm. dad. Um, so doctor's history um, runs quite deep in the family. Hmm. Um, when my dad was studying, uh, obviously it gets to a certain point where uh, they have to go and start actually doing practical work in the field. Yeah. And I know he said it was the old Hrutiskir hospital, not Ooh, the I have new a one. I have a couple stories about Hrutiskir really? as well, yeah. So this was the old one, not the new one they built. Um, and they were busy doing, uh, they, they were sort of in the maternity ward and busy checking on um, women who were going into labour and there is, I think back then, I don't know, it probably still is like this now, they would have to stay through the night. Mm. Um, and what would happen was him and his colleagues would be put into groups mm. and then they would split the patients up between them and keep an eye on them. Yeah. And the way this worked back then was to monitor the woman, um, they would use probes. Mm. The moment they would, the woman st would start to dilate and the cervix would start to open up and the head would start to crown, mm. they would put these uh, probes 
onto the baby's scalps. Okay. And that acts <laughs> I'm learning new things about the medical field here. Yeah. <laughs> and that acts as the monitors to monitor the baby heart and um, just everything yeah. that they need to know. And if the uh, pressure on those probes would go to all the readings, if it went too high or too low, then the baby was in trouble. Yeah. So that's how it would monitor the babies during uh, the labor process. Mm. So they had set up a whole lot of probes on some of the women and it was late into the night so they went back to the doctor's room mm. um, and apparently about 2 or 3 a.m. they would have to every now and then obviously go and do rounds and just check on how everybody's doing yeah. and keep an eye on those readings. And around 2 or 3 a.m. Uh, one of my dad's colleagues went and apparently saw this one woman in specifically, mm. her baby was suddenly out on the bed what? The probe still attached to it, uh, but yeah, it had been delivered and it was lying out on the bed. Oh my so God. she got a bit freaked out about how that happened. <laughs> just a bit, just a little bit freaked out. <laughs> and she ran back to my dad and all the others, and she said, this baby's been delivered, it's out on the bed. So all of them ran, um, got to the room, the baby was still inside. They did. Then they, they went and did like a test, and just to make sure the baby was still inside, because this mm. was such an odd thing for uh, one of the doctors to say. Yeah. Um, so they did the test. The baby was still inside. But when they did those tests, the uh, all the readings mm. were like blank. The baby looked like it was dead. Oh my word. So they immediately rushed into theater they did a uh, c-section they got the baby out then they resuscitated it and managed to get it breathing again but what what my dad always has felt was that this woman had a vision Mm. of that something had gone wrong and that this the baby was in a way trying to tell them something's wrong you need to help me (laughs) and yeah so they managed sitting here with goosebumps right now that is crazy my dad that's how he described it he was like she had a vision there was something wrong with the baby and if they hadn't gone right then and there um, rushed her to theatre and resuscitated that baby she would have lost that baby that is insane <laughs> but like I said I also have a couple stories about uh, Grote Skid I'm not sure if your dad maybe mentioned this but I know that when my aunt did her is it they called her residency yes she did her residency there and um, she said there was a, like a, a thing that sort of everyone knew about which was the night bird no, and, I don't know um, that. Yeah, so apparently you knew that a patient would be passing away if you heard this night bird outside oh of their window. Oh, word. So that was one of the stories I heard, but there were so many others. There's yeah. so much trauma going on with those patients and so many deaths. So, yeah, I also heard a lot of stories about the different hospitals my dad and my grandfather worked at and the most bizarre stories they went through. And funny enough, uh, so my grandfather ran his practice in Kimberley. Mm. And like I know all my life, my mom and my dad have told me my grandfather has experienced some of the most astounding, weird cases. Um, Him is a very small town, so often there's you know, doctors we get called out in the middle of the night to go to certain patients and that, and everybody knows everybody. Hmm. And one night, uh, one of the my, my grandfather was apparently called out. Hmm. Um, because they believed something actually I don't even know what they what they told him but he was called out and he arrived at the house um, to find this teenage girl in this room where objects were flying around the room there what? were actual objects flying around the room this and is like the exorcist exactly and it turns out it was a poltergeist and as I mentioned earlier teenage girls and just oh. starting out on the emotional journeys um, yeah that's what was spiking it and this poor teenage girl had a poltergeist that was like attached to her and like <laughs> spiking up things like that I love how they're not like let's call the priest they're like let's call the doctor well, that's the thing <laughs> that's what I said to my mom I was like why would they call a doctor why did my grandfather go out for things like that um And she said, well, I guess, you know, like if somebody starts acting strange and that the first thing you would think is they need some kind of medical help. I suppose. Uh, There was another case where he was called out again, also for paranormal things. Hmm. But I I guess at the time they were thinking maybe there's a mental problem. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, And what happened was that uh, there was this guy who was actually possessed. Oh, my word. And my grandfather (laughs) arrived at the house and he walked in the door and there was this guy standing up on top of a cupboard (gasps) as he walked into the room and he was like looking mad and crazy. No, thank you. And as my grandfather walked through the door, he took a lunch. He jumped off the cupboard towards my grandfather. Oh, my word. 
who <laughs> then punched him as he <laughs> punching <laughs> ghosts left and right. <laughs> so my grandfather literally punched him as he died to uh, dive towards him, oh. knocked him out. But yeah, it's it's that's the thing. As a doctor, you wouldn't believe you would have encounters like that. But I guess one of the first things you do do is try psychiatrists, you try doctors, you try and find the logical reason. Yeah, I suppose. I didn't really think about it that way, but it's true. Going back to the whole thing of, you know, poltergeist activity being very active around youngsters, um, I know that a lot of my really intense paranormal experiences also happened when I was around 13, 14. Um, we moved into a house, it was a beautiful old Victorian house, and um, I think I moved in when I was quite a bit younger and didn't experience a lot of stuff, but the activity picked up at around 13, 14. And I mean, just, I mean, the first creepiest thing about it is we obviously did a lot of repairs to the house when we got in and we sanded down all the doors and they all had numbers on them. That's so, scary. Yeah. So, I mean, it could have been anything. We're presuming it was sort of like a boarding house. That would make sense. Uh, numbers on rooms, that's either a boarding house or like a hospital. So, I would oh, say. Oh, wow. I never, thought, <laughs> I never thought of it as a hospital. No, that's creepy. But uh, we presumed boarding house. Um, and it would make sense because obviously with things like boarding houses, hospitals, hotels, whatever, so much energy passes through there. Um, but I think like... I remember the first experience I had was, you know, just an uneasy feeling in general, but, you know, I was super into the paranormal at that point in my life, so I was like, maybe I'm just making this up. But I was sitting on my bed the one night studying for exams, a rare occurrence for me, um, <laughs> and I had a dressing table across from my bed where I put my, you know, my deodorant, my school name badge, all that sort of stuff. And I was sitting there, going through my work, and my name badge flew off the counter and hit me in the chest so hard that it actually left a mark. That would traumatize <laughs> me for the rest of my life. But, you know, being slightly skeptical and wanting to explain things away until they're not explainable anymore, I thought, you know, maybe the back of the badge came loose, you know, flicked across. That's some really good, <laughs> like, trying to cover things up. I would never be able to make any story <laughs> up for that. No logical thing at all. Well, that was my that was my theory at the time. So I was like, OK, that was weird, but whatever. You know, put my name badge back on the dressing table, went back to studying. And the next moment, the lid of my deodorant can popped off, f didn't go up into the air, flew at me again. No, come on, and please tell me, me you did not sit no. still for that one. At that point, I got up and I went to my mom and I was like, mm -mm, not going to be doing that anymore, thank you. Um, <laughs> but that was sort of the start of it. And I don't, I don't consider myself maybe a sensitive or like an empath or anything, but I always had this idea that there was a family of <laughs> ghosts or entities in my room. Oh great, more than one. Yeah, I, I figured in my head for some reason I came to the conclusion it was a mother, father and a son. And um, the one night I was actually sleeping, all my lights were off, it was pretty dark and um, I opened my eyes and just like a flash image of a little boy was right next to my face. Um, so I was like, I almost felt like that was confirmation that there was at least a, a young Go or young spirit with me in my room. Props to you for sticking around <laughs> that house. I would have gone homeless and stepped on the street. <laughs> well, there was another thing is that um, the one night I, we had uh, an informal lounge, like TV lounge upstairs, sort of across from my room. And um, I remember coming from the TV lounge, walking into my room, and as I opened the door, it almost looked like someone was throwing a black blanket over me to the point where I actually like dodged out the way and there was nothing there. So I was like, no That's thanks. Bizarre. I'm gonna be sleeping in the lounge tonight. And so yeah, I did. <laughs> so many weird things happened in that house. I mean, to this day, the one thing that freaks me out the most is I had this dream that was, I'm, I'm actually probably going to elaborate on the dream in a future episode, so I won't spoil too much, but ever since that moment, every nightmare that I've had, even after moving out of the house, has been about that house. 
That's very, very scary. I know a lot of paranormal investigators take that as a sign that something's calling them back to that location. Well, I know that if I ever got the chance to investigate that house, I would do it in a heartbeat. That's very brave, <laughs> considering what you went through. Well, I hope you know you're coming with me. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yay. But yeah, do you have any other stories that you'd like to share? Um, Funny enough, I didn't experience all that much as a kid and... To this day, I'm still petrified of all this stuff, which is a wonder that I'll still go on all these things, but it does form a bit of an addiction. Most of my stories that I grew up with were from my dad and my grandfather mm. and maybe my mom telling me some things. I know there was an incident where, also when my dad, I think, was studying and he was working at uh, the Brooklyn Chest Hotel. Mm. Uh, that's here in Cape Town. Um, and that hotel, I don't know if you know, it... Uh, holds all the TB patients. I did not know that. So, um, my dad Wait, again... Wait, holds or held? I think it's still running. Oh, wow. I do okay. believe it's still running. Alrighty. Um, so, again, they were put into groups and they had to, um, obviously keep an eye on the patients through the night. And again, uh, in the middle of the night, one night, they were all sitting in the doctor's room and a man suddenly walked into the room mm. uh, and my dad explained it in like such detail. He said he was wearing a white shirt, he had a blue j jacket on um, and all over the white shirt and jacket was blood and oh blood was word. like dripping down his mouth. Oh my word. And then the man walked out and they had recognized him as one of the patients from the rooms. So they all jumped up and went to that ward to go and find him. Um, and there the man was in the bed in his hospital gown I think what? his clothes were to the side on his chair, but his clothes were full of blood, apparently, if I understood that correctly, um, but he had passed. So again, it was like him coming to tell them, okay, I've passed on and yeah. <laughs> I love how all of your family's like ghost stories are just like something straight out of a horror movie. Exactly, like as if being a doctor is not enough stress and work and just a full-time thing, you get to experience all these wonderful things as well. That is crazy, but I'm not gonna lie, loving them, because it's literally like when someone tells you a story around the campfire and you're like, that's spooky, I'm not sleeping tonight. So. Exactly, but you still have that thing like, but it's not true, it's not true, I can go to sleep, that didn't actually happen. These did. Yeah, that that is so creepy, but um, I had, I think to this day, it's still probably my most intense experience. Um, we were looking after a friend's, a family friend's house, and they only had the one spare bedroom, which my mom stayed in, and I was like, okay, I'll take the couch, you know, I'm the kid. I'll take the couch. <laughs> and um, they're, they have one of those sort of sunken lounges mm -hmm. where everything else is upstairs and it looks down into the lounge. So I was sleeping, well, trying to sleep and just could not get comfortable. I had my back to the staircase um, and the landing. I could not get comfortable and I thought maybe if I, you know, switch positions and lie at the other end, maybe I'll get comfortable and I can fall asleep. So I got up and moved to the other end of the couch and as I looked up, I saw a woman and stereotypical ghost story no. vibes. She was in a white, long white nightgown, but she just looked, and it was a flash, but I could tell that she just looked so mad. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> like she was- Be out of there. She was looking at me like she wanted me out. And so I turned around, saw her and screamed. And as I screamed, she disappeared. But obviously my mom came running out. She thought I was being murdered. <laughs> That's absolutely terrifying. I don't know how you got through your childhood years. <laughs> I really don't. Like I said, that was probably my most intense experience because it was a full body apparition that I saw. But I know, and you try to explain it away. You're like, you know, maybe I was half asleep. I was not asleep. Oh my word. Yeah. I really don't know how you got through all that as a kid. I mean, I only got most of my experiences later on in my years. Yeah. Um, probably the most around uh, the work we did together. Mm. Maybe one or two incidents before that, but uh, two, I was like a good while out of school and they terrified the living daylights out of me, it reduced me to like a crying like little kid. So I don't know how you handled that as a tiny child. I mean, I wasn't, when the full-bodied apparition happened, I wasn't tiny, I was probably around 16. That's tiny. <laughs> but yeah, um, a lot of, I feel like a lot of my paranormal experiences happened more when I was a teenager. And I think they actually sort of, you know, spurred me on to keep investigating the paranormal and 
really like sparked my interest in it. Well, it was you who spurred me on. Like I said, it forms this like, even though I'm petrified of it, it forms this weird like fascination and addiction in a way. And you just, it's so, it spikes your curiosity and you just keep going. It's, I think it's because, you know, you have these experiences that you can't explain and you want the answers. Exactly. Um, which I think is actually really great, personally. Um, but yeah. That, those are our stories. I hope you guys enjoyed them. We enjoyed telling them. I, I know I did, Megs. I know yeah, I did too. <laughs> um, but yeah, tune in next week. We're going to be talking about... Haunted objects. And yeah, we have a whole lot of new scary things to keep telling you guys. So Yeah, so stick around, come back next week, and we'll check you guys then. Freaky Fridays, hosted by Devin Beatty and Megan Portnoy, and produced with the generous assistance of Yanu Blau and Blended Podcasts. Brought to you by Blended Audio.